Good evening, everybody. Welcome. We are live from Books and Books right here in Coral Gables, Florida, with uh, thanks to the Knight Foundation for their generous support. Just a reminder to our internet audience, if at any time during the presentation this evening you'd like to order a copy of tonight's book, please give us a call on the number on your screen and we'll get a copy signed for you and we'll ship it to you uh, free of charge for the shipping anyway here in the U.S. Uh, for those of you here, I ask you to silence your cell phones and don't forget to pick up a copy of our Books and Books newsletter. This will give you the synopsis of all the wonderful events we have at Books and Books every night of the week. We do an average of 60 events every month, sometimes four a night. And we usually have something for everyone's taste. We have kids' events. We have uh, first-time authors. We have poetry readings, celebrity signings, Spanish events, and so on. So I encourage you to uh, pick up a copy of the newsletter. Or you can go to our website, booksandbooks.com. Please give us your email address when you visit there. So you will be apprised of everything that goes on here, and you won't miss a thing. And also don't forget to visit our newest location. Uh, Books and Books now has a outlet at the uh, historic Sears Tower downtown at the Adrian Arsh Center. So we have a full bar, full cafe, beautiful bookstore. Uh, please make that part of your agenda while you're here. If you are visiting, if you do live here, you need to go there when you're not here. <laughs> uh, tonight we welcome Mr. David O. Stewart and his latest work of history, Madison's Gift. But to introduce Mr. Stewart this evening, we have a very special guest. Taking its name from Shakespeare's famous quote, what is past is prologue, the Prologue Society is a not-for-profit organization sponsored by Northern Trust in Miami today, as well as Books and Books. Bringing together diverse members of our community who share a love of history, the Prologue Society hosts luncheons each season to hear writers and historians of local, national, and international stature. Great effort is made to provide topics spanning many different cultures, geographic locations, and time periods. Please welcome the chairperson of the Prologue Society, Mr. Dabney Park. Good evening. Steve uh, mentioned that we're live tonight, and the reason for that is there's a little camera up there, but I do have to tell you I'm happy to be alive tonight and happy to be here. Um, welcome to Books and Books. This institution is one we should never take for granted. Um, it's a very special place, one of the most successful independent bookstores in the country. The work of the people here is enormously important to the continued viability and existence of the printed book. Authors like David O. Stewart can write, but if they have no place to sell their words, uh, they have nothing, and Books and Books is one of the best places to do that. As uh, Steve said, my name is Dabney Park. Most people know me as Buddy, Bud. Uh, I've been asked to introduce this evening's author on account of the Prologue Society, which Steve uh, nicely has already presented to you. I will tell you that um, uh, there'll be some brochures on the table over here uh, to pick up if you like. We meet uh, seven or eight times a year in the winter months. We have a nice luncheon at the Riviera Country Club. Uh, everybody who comes gets a copy of the book signed by the author, and we get a talk much like the talk that we'll enjoy tonight. Uh, I think of it as the kind of like the first class uh, airline lounge for history books. Um, but new member applications uh, are now we're now accepting them for the fall season which will start in October but tonight we're here to listen to David Stewart tell us about his new book Madison's gift five partnerships that built America when I say new I should tell you that the ink may still be wet on your copy the book is only seven days out of release David Stewart's a man who just can't figure out what, who he wants to be when he grows up or what he wants to do he's a, he's a lawyer a novelist and a historian it's lucky for us because he excels at all three vocations and is, is apparently committed to uh, continuing to pursue all three at the same time. Certainly his career as a lawyer fueled his work in literature and history. He grew up in Albany and on Staten Island, graduated from Yale University in 1973 and received his law degree also from Yale in 1978. We won't hold that against him. After working as a clerk for the Supreme Court Justice, for a Supreme Court Justice and two federal appellate justices, he practiced law for 25 years. Practice in constitutional law, including several cases before the United States Supreme Court, uh, led to his first book, The Summer of 1787, which deals with that hot, difficult, and seemingly endless sequestration of the framers of our Constitution in Philadelphia that year. In 1989, David was called to defend a U.S. District Judge Walter Nixon in an impeachment trial before the United States Senate. That experience led to his second book, Impeached, The Trial of President Andrew Johnson and the Fight for Lincoln's Legacy. 
published in 2009. Curiosity about impeachment led to an interest in treason. 2011, he published American Emperor, Aaron Burr's challenge to, the Jefferson, to Jefferson's America. And then he turned to historical fiction, producing The Lincoln Deception in 2013, a book that explores the secrets behind John Wilkes Booth's, the John Wilkes Booth conspiracy. All of his books have won numerous prizes. Our great nation has been from time to time blessed with persons who rose to the occasion, whose character and skills were ripe for the time, whose dedication to liberty and democracy drove them to give all they had for the republic. James Madison was such a man. Now David Stewart has authored Madison's Gift, Five Partnerships That Built America. James Madison was a Virginia gentleman, George Washington's protege, Alexander, Alexander Hamilton's co-author, John, Thomas Jefferson's sidekick, James Monroe, James Monroe's competitor, and Dolly Madison's lover. I will leave it to David to tell us about Madison's accomplishments as a statesman and president, and about how the partnerships with each of these remarkable people established a pattern of collaboration that has always represented the very best of the American nation. Please welcome David Stewart. Thank you very much, Bud and Steve, and thank you all for coming here, and those of you out in the ether of the internet. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. This is a wonderful institution, as Bud said, and one um, to which we should be, for which we are all grateful, uh, certainly those of us who write books. Um, I want to, and I also want to thank you all for having me down here in the coldest week that Maryland has seen in a long time. Uh, <laughs> It, it, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm just trying not to think about my pipes. Um, <laughs> I became fascinated with James Madison. I've written a couple of books around him and that touched upon him. Uh, and there were really two facts that kept getting my attention. The first was that he was so central to the founding. Um, I really came ultimately came to the conclusion that he was more important, frankly, than anybody other than George Washington. Washington was the guy. You just can't replace him. He was the indispensable man. But Madison's list of achievements is astonishing. Uh, he was a principal reason the Constitutional Convention was called. He wrote the Virginia Plan that, be that began the convention and was deeply engaged in the writing of the Constitution at the convention. He spoke, uh, he was among the five delegates who spoke most frequently. Um, he and Hamilton co-wrote the Federalist Papers, which were the propaganda uh, campaign to get the Constitution ratified, which was by no means a sure thing. He was the leading member of the first Congress. Uh, he was the, often referred to as George Washington's prime minister. He wrote much of the legislation that set up the government. That. Uh, began this whole wonderful experiment in self-government. Um, he wrote the Bill of Rights. It's, he just wrote them. Um, and he secured their adoption. Uh, he was a co-founder of the first American political party. This is one of the achievements he might not be that proud of. Um, but when the Washington administration developed policies, principally Alexander Hamilton's financial policies that Madison didn't like, he wanted to oppose them, and he discovered that the only effective way to oppose them was to form a political party, and that's what he and Thomas Jefferson did. And in the pivotal election of 1800, they won the presidency for Jefferson with this Republican Party. It's often said that the true test of a democracy is if you can have a transfer of power between uh, contending factions, and in the election of 1800, we proved that we could. He was Secretary of State for the Louisiana Purchase. I, I sometimes neglect the, uh, here we go. Uh, this is Madison at the Constitutional Convention along with many of the others. Um, the Louisiana Purchase doubled the size of the country, the largest uh, increase in our size in our history. He was the first wartime president in the War of 1812. 
often overlooked for this. He explored the powers of the president and also how do you deal with dissent during a time of war because it was a pretty unpopular war. And this finally came through to me. He was our only two-term president, I think, who had a better second term than his first term. Think back in your own lifetime. How many presidents had a better term than their in their second term than their first? I don't think there, there's really any. So this is an amazing list of achievements over a 30-year period. He's at the center of everything. But then there's the second fact, which is even though Madison's always there, even though he's doing something terribly important, he's often overlooked. I found myself telling my editor that he's sort of the zealot of the founding. He's in the picture, but nobody's paying any attention to him. And I wondered why that was, and I wanted to think about that. There's, of course, a flip answer. He was short. <laughs> he was skinny. He had a soft voice. And in rooms that were filled with noisy people like John Adams or Alexander Hamilton, rooms like this room, uh, that's the image of the Constitutional Convention, and large charismatic men like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, <laughs> Madison was easy to miss. And it's a flip answer, but I actually think there's something to it. But there's also a, a somewhat more complicated and more interesting answer, which is Madison was different from a lot of great leaders. They often have strong streaks of narcissism. They need to be at the front of the parade, preferably on a white horse. They crave recognition and acclaim. Madison didn't have those qualities. He disliked public events. He was miserable at them. At his first inaugural, inaugural ball, this is the pinnacle of his political career. He has been elected president. He's the man. And an old friend greets him and congratulates him heartily, and Madison says, oh, Lord, I would rather be home in bed. <laughs> and it was genuine. He just hated big public occasions. He cared about results, not applause about making the American experiment in self-government a success and about realizing the promise of the American Revolution. You know, a long-term colleague offered this striking description, which I got focused on, which was, under all circumstances, Madison was collected and ever mindful of what was due from him to others and cautious not to wound the feelings of anyone. And that phrase really resonated with me ever mindful of what was due from him to others. So I think that's really not true for many of our leaders. I think they're ever mindful of what's due from us to them. <laughs> not so much about what's due from them to other people. <coughs> and as I started looking more and more at Madison, it emerged that he rarely operated alone. His great achievements really were the fruit of partnerships. I've already sort of previewed a couple of them. And one way to think about it that I've used is it's almost as though he took a modern personality, a self-assessment. You know, the organizations today love to make their people do this, find out if they're an ISGB or whatever they are, <laughs> the, the choices are. And a self-assessment for James Madison would have included he was short, he was skinny, he had a soft voice, and he had zero charisma. But there were also po powerful positives. He was smarter than almost anybody he met. He had a rare appetite for hard work. He had a gift for making a connection with people. And he had extraordinary political judgment and foresight. So why not make common cause with people who could complement his talents? And we don't know, of course, that he made such an assessment. But I found that this idea provided a clarifying lens to look through, look at his career, which is such an extraordinary one, as a man who understood the power of partnership. I would even suggest that there, there are some important lessons from Madison's style that could apply to all times, even to our time. Um, I found myself focused on five central partnerships, which happily enough I was able to make somewhat chronological so it becomes the, the spine of the, the book. And he formed them with very different people. There we go. Um, 
I'm always happy to get this to work. Um, Alexander Hamilton was the first one, and Hamilton and he were such different people. Hamilton was an orphan from the Caribbean. He had nothing, very different from all the founders. He was a completely self-made man. Flashy, charismatic personality. Uh, and his peers recognized him as a little bit dangerous at times. Madison, in personality, was so different. He was the quiet man in the corner. But they recognized in each other two things. One was, each discovered the other guy was incredibly smart and thoughtful, and they valued that. And the other was that they discovered that they each had a powerful commitment to making sure that the American experiment survived, that, they, that this attempt at self-government worked. In the 1780s, the country was in a terrible fix. There really was open talk of dissolving into three separate nations. And it was Madison and Hamilton together who really brought the nation to that constitutional convention, they had very different experiences at the convention, and then fought for ratification even though neither of them really much liked the Constitution. I mean, Madison was ambivalent about it, and Hamilton really didn't like it, but they thought it was the best chance we had to survive as a nation. Now, the second character is the great man, George Washington. No one was Washington's peer. Madison was 19 years younger, was really a different generation. Could have been young enough to be Madison, uh, Washington's son, excuse me. And with Washington, he became the consummate aide. He became the indispensable man for the indispensable man. And when Washington needed something done, he learned that Madison was a man who got things done. If he needed to get it, something through the Virginia Assembly calling for a constitutional convention, Madison could make that happen. If he had to get the Constitution recommended in a backhanded way through the Confederation Congress, Madison could make that happen. If he needed the ratification fight to go forward in the Virginia Convention, Madison did that. So he depended greatly, and for the first six, eight months of the country, of the Washington administration, he had no closer confidant, no closer advisor than Madison. The third partner is Thomas Jefferson. He's coming soon. Okay. Well, we all know what he looked like. He was tall and red-haired. <laughs> um, good heavens. So Jefferson and Madison were really soulmates. They came from the same background. They grew up 30 miles apart. Finally. He was shy, too. Um, they were both eldest sons of very rich landowners. Uh, they both were great slaveholders. Jefferson owned over 200, Madison about 100. They were both inveterate bookworms. They knew something about almost any, everything. They were interested in everything. Their letters are, to each other are a delight. And politically, they agreed on most things. There were a few things, a lot of times style issues on which they disagreed. Uh, Jefferson tended to be more of a visionary, what, not too good on the details. Madison was very much focused on execution, very good at getting things done. They, ma they matched up well that way. Jefferson came to rely on Madison's judgment very much because Jefferson had a tendency to sort of say things without thinking them through. And he would rely on Madison to reel him in, which he did on a number of occasions in their joint career. Now James Monroe, who seems to be equally shy. <laughs> there we go. I think I need to be over there. Um, Monroe <coughs> was a friend for many years but sometimes a rival. He was a different kind of guy. He was a military gut person, much more than an intellectual. I was somewhat dismayed in my research. I hadn't learned much about Monroe until this book. And it was a little disappointing the number of people who felt it necessary to write 
in their recollections of Monroe that they found him a little dim. Um, just sort of disappointing. But he and Madison were friends, their families would uh, socialize together. They did run against each other twice politically. The first was uh, the election for the first Congress. They both ran for an, an office, uh, for the seat from central Virginia. Uh, it's the only time in our history the two future presidents opposed each other in a con contest for lower office. Madison won handily. Uh, and then in 1808, when Madison was running for president the first time, Monroe, who had some grievances with Madison from some diplomatic dis uh, disagreements, uh, allowed his name to be put into uh, nomination against him. But despite that, when the War of 1812 was brewing, and Madison was a strong leader in that. He actually, I think, led the nation into war. Madison needed a strong figure in his cabinet. He was, Madison was not a military figure. He uh, described him physically too many times now, but he just didn't inspire that sort of military ardor. And Monroe was a guy who did. He was a big strapping six-footer who was never happier than when he was on a horse in front of some men with, with carrying rifles. And that was important to have in his cabinet. Monroe served as his Secretary of State. He also served as his Secretary of War. For some of the time during the war, he served as both, both Secretary of War and Secretary of State simultaneously. And he was an essential uh, support during the war. Finally, there is, of course, Dolly, his wife of 42 years. She was the star. She brought charisma and warmth and unfailing charm. She's also a very smart woman. And we don't have time here tonight for me to talk about all five of these partnerships. So I'm just going to go straight to the interesting one, which is Dolly. Um, this image of her, and we're going to have to skip through Hamilton because we're just going to skip through him. Um, <laughs> and a couple of other things. Uh, and here are the Federalist Papers. I'm sorry. What I like about this image that you're going to see soon is this is Dolly in her Quaker bonnet because she was raised a Quaker. She grew up on plantations in Virginia, but as a Quaker, she was subject to the rigors of their religion, which she didn't like. Her father was forced by the Quaker hierarchy in Virginia to sell his slaves. They decided that Quakers should not own slaves. And he moved to Philadelphia with his family. And his business failed. He died shortly thereafter, but Dolly flourished in Philadelphia. She was a lovely young woman. She was tall for the time. She had an hourglass figure, a mischievous smile, black hair, creamy complexion, and blue eyes. Men tended to like her. They tended to like her a lot. And I always like to point out that say what you will about Madison's small stature, his receding hairline, his social reserve. Of the founders, he had the hottest wife. <laughs> Dolly's first husband, and there was a first husband, was a Quaker lawyer in Philadelphia, and they had two sons together. But the hu first husband and one of their sons died in the yellow fever epidemic of 1793. She was left as a single mother of one, but she was not left on the market long. She was pursued by many, and one of her more ardent suitors, indeed her most ardent suitor, became James Madison. And the story is that he met her some saw her somewhere on the street or at a social event and basically said, who is that woman? discovered who it was and arranged, discovered that Aaron Burr rented a room from Dolly's mother's uh, in her boarding house. So he had Burr set up an introduction. And there's a wonderful uh, note Dolly writes on the day that they're to meet. And I think it reflects both her uh, sophistication and her playful nature that she wrote that she was going to that afternoon meet the great little Madison. Because in fact, he was, of course, short. She couldn't miss that. But he also was great. 
he was wealthy, he was kind, he was intelligent, and he was a powerful public figure. And one of the things I enjoyed in researching this and going into their relationship was to find Hamilton's personal side. He, we tend to think of him this, as this creature of intellect. One of his contemporaries said, there, I've never seen so much mind in so little matter. Um, but in fact, he was a person with a lot of feelings and they were really a, a lot of fun. His letters to Dolly, and they were rarely apart, so we don't have many of those letters, but they are warm and loving, and long after the first rush of infatuation. I was really struck to find several accounts of his flirtatiousness. Dolly's widowed sister Lucy came to live with them in the White House with her children for several years. Uh, Madison apparently delighted in kissing Dolly before his sister-in-law and then turning to her and asking whether it made her mouth water. <laughs> now, I'll grant you it's a little creepy, <laughs> but it's not how you've ever thought of James Madison before. <laughs> now, the Madisons, who never had children of their own, I think are sometimes imagined as this semi-sad childless couple, when in fact their house was ordinarily overrun with children. Uh, they had dozens of nieces and nephews, more than 50 as near as I can tell, who stayed with them for weeks on end, sometimes months. Uh, children of friends would come and stay with them, often young ladies for whom Dolly would find suitable matches. This was the era of Jane Austen and finding a suitable match for a young woman was a full-time job. Uh, and it's also often missed that just how much fun the Madisons were to be around. I've described him in small groups, uh, and it was very unusual for someone to meet him in a large group and not think he was a cold fish. But in small groups, he came alive. He was funny, he was a wisecracker, quick with a quip, and a humorous anecdote. Dolly was always vivacious and engaging, no matter the size of the audience, and was a one of her nieces referred to her as a faux de dullness. I do like to share this uh, image of uh, James, which was painted about the time he was courting Dolly, because it's, I think, the only image in which he actually looks like a guy who might be fun. Um, <laughs> otherwise, he looks pretty sober. Um, I was pretty surprised to discover that the Madisons had a tendency for roughhousing. This is Montpelier, their wonderful estate in Western Virginia. I encourage you if you have a chance to go see it. Uh, there's a big front porch there and James and Dolly would run races against each other on the porch. Now, you can probably tell even from this image, it's not that big a porch, so they weren't really long races, but they were older at the time, so <laughs> we can cut them a little slack on that. Um, there's also another account that Dolly would sometimes load James up on her back and carry him through the house. She was larger than he was. Um, she made the biggest difference, though, in the social life of the Republic. Their fun really did have a purpose. Through his eight years as Secretary of State and eight as President, <coughs> Dolly set a bright social tone and this is an image, I think, of Dolly in those years, which gives you a sense of her in her full flower. She was gay and gracious, always seeking out the most awkward person in the room, trying to set him or her at their ease. She understood the need to provide some glamour and charisma to the Madison household. She knew that James just couldn't do that. So, as wife of the president, she took to wearing these large turbans of uh, velvet or uh, uh, satin, and she would put big feathers in them, sometimes pieces of fruit, and it had a couple of effects. One was it was amazing, but the other was you always knew where Dolly was, and she was a, a tallish woman and not a small woman as time went on. Um, and it could be hard to find James in a crowd. 
He's very often off in the corner. And so she loved the spotlight, the very spotlight that he really didn't much care to be in. It was a great match. Um, she loved to play cards. She uh, took snuff with the gentleman. Uh, one of her favorite snuff partner, snuff taking partners was the spe young speaker of the house, Henry Clay. And they had a famous exchange where he said, in a sort of public courtier stance, everybody loves Mrs. Madison. And she responded immediately, that's because Mrs. Madison loves everyone. Which wasn't strictly speaking true. Um, she actually was a good bit better at holding a grudge than James was. But it seemed to be true. And in the political world, as we all know, what seems to be true is far more important. They freely mixed all different kinds of people at their social events, creating this sort of platform where the sinews of policy and politics can grow and strengthen. In an informal setting, a lot of times things can get said. Progress can be made on projects that don't happen in formal meetings. She was often referred to at the time because the term first lady had not come into uh, vogue yet. So she was referred to as the lady presidentess. And people would go see the lady presidentess if they wanted a federal job. And they would urge her to present their petition to the president. And she was actually pretty good at that. And she was, in truth, a political partner throughout. Always a loyal and sure-footed one who not only warmed his private life, but helped forge a new Republican style for the nation. Indeed, the Federalist candidate for president in 1808 claimed that he had lost to Mr. and Mrs. Madison. I might have had a better chance had I faced Mr. Madison alone. Now, Dolly's shining moment, the one she is most often remembered for, oh, is happened on the day that was James's worst day in office. It was in late August of 1814 when British troops stormed into Washington and burned our public buildings, including the White House. Madison, of course, had to flee. It would have been terrible for him to be captured by the British soldiers, but he was denounced in many places around the country as a coward for having fled. And of course, this was a humiliating experience for the whole nation. It's been a black mark on his historical reputation. But there was a memorable episode that afternoon when the British were getting closer and Dolly had to clear out too. She remembered to pull down the Gilbert Stewart portrait of George Washington. We don't have a king, of course, but if we have a patriotic patrimony. It's around George Washington and around this portrait. And Americans took great pride that even if Madison was a squirrely little guy who took to the hills, his wife stuck around and made sure that George Washington was, was looked after the way she should have been. He should have been. Now, after the presidency and the War of 1812 was a very difficult time for the nation and for Madison, but afterwards there was a wonderful resurgence. The economy came roaring back to life. The country was happy, yeah. to the extent you can say that of a country, but there was a great good feeling towards Madison. And he retired with great joy, he was in his late 60s, to Montpelier. And he enjoyed about 10 years of very happy retirement. During that time, though, increasingly slavery became more and more a dark shadow in his life. Now, it had always been a shadow in his life. One of the shocking things for me was to learn that Madison's grandfather had been poisoned and killed by a slave. People don't write about this. And it's the sort of story that all of the white Madisons at Montpelier and all of the black slaves at Montpelier absolutely knew, but never spoke about. There is no recorded evidence that Madison ever said a word about this to anybody. But what more powerful memory could there be of the violence, the danger, and the 
outright horribleness of slavery. And as a young man, Madison struggled with the contradictions between slavery and the American liberty he claimed to be fighting for. Indeed, he bought land in upstate New York and made plans to relocate. He wrote to a friend that he hoped to live his life free of the labor of slaves. He didn't want to be part of it. This contradiction between dedicating his life to human freedom and being a slaveholder was excruciating. He also feared that slavery wonder, would undermine the, the nation. He could see that Northerners did not understand slavery and that they were hostile about it and that Southerners became defensive about it. At the Constitutional Convention, he spoke repeatedly about the risk <coughs> that slavery would undermine the Union. This is in 1787. After he becomes a of national figure, he becomes a political player. He seems to have been able to put the slavery issue out of his mind, to compartmentalize it. Some of it you have to figure he is seduced by the comfort of it all. It's great having a hundred slaves if there's work to be done. Everything that had to be done in those days involved an amazing amount of human labor. It also was probably the product of his sheer busyness but he seems not to have been tortured by it for a number of years. But then in retirement, it came back at him. Part of it may have been just living at Montpelier again all year round, surrounded by a hundred people whose freedom he controlled and in fact had denied. And he became obsessive on the subject, developing plans to somehow end slavery. <coughs> and they all involved selling off our lands out west, the public land, using the money to buy the slaves out of uh, slavery because, of course, the slaveholders had to be made whole and also uh, somehow getting the slaves out of the country because he thought race prejudice was so great that freed men would be treated miserably, their lives would be terrible. So they had to go to Africa or to Central America or out west, anywhere else. All of these plans were fanciful. They were not realistic. They were not, in the truest sense, Madisonian. In his life, he had taken on the biggest issues that faced the country when we were falling apart in the 1780s, when we were being, uh, our trade was devastated in the early 1800s and the Napoleonic Wars and Britain and France were seizing our ships and our seamen. It was Madison who finally decided we had to go to war, the War of 1812, to establish our credibility, our nationhood. And slavery was the third great problem that he couldn't ever fix. And he couldn't come up with an answer. And I think some of the reason for that was that he couldn't think about it the way you needed to think about it. You know, he lived into the era. He lived into 1836 until he was 85 years old. He lived into the abolition era. He lived into the time when Nat Turner and his rebellion in southeastern Virginia killed 60 white people and 100 slaves were slaughtered. He saw the violence that was going to come out and he was terrified about it. But he was still not able to deal with the prejudice side because that was where he always got hung up. He couldn't see the human side of that and it was a failing and it was one that really uh, haunted him. Another be be vexing part of the, this picture is that even though Dolly was raised a Quaker, even though her life was significantly changed as a girl because of slavery, we have no record of any thing she ever said about slavery, even the 13 years she lived after James's death. We don't know what her opinion was. I wouldn't guess. Uh, we know that she held slaves right up to the day she died. Um, in his final years, James became increasingly decrepit. This is an image painted just a couple of years before his death when he's in his 80s. Uh, he would greet his 
guests, and he loved to get guests right up to the end. Uh, in his dressing gown and nightcap, he'd sometimes lie in bed and just talk to them. They would, they would think he was actually dead when he arrived. He looked so terrible. But he would talk for four or five hours. He read everything still. He was interested in everything. And he, he once told a, a visitor who kept trying to make excuses to let him rest, he said, well, my lungs are the only part of me that still works. Um, he could no longer write letters. The arthritis in his hands was so terrible that he had to dictate them to Dolly and her brother. And as she wrote to a friend, his hands are f and fingers are still so swelled and sore as to be nearly useless, but I lend him mine. He lived the last two years of his life in two rooms. He could only get from one room to the other. In the last six months, he was carried from one room to the other by his slave. After James died in 1836, Dolly moved back to Washington City. We're very fortunate that she lived long enough that she could have her photograph taken. And this is a photograph we have of her. I think you get some sense of her strength of character. And it also includes something I always like about her in all of her portraits and in this photograph. There is also a sense of fun that you can see there, a sense that she actually, as soon as the camera, the photograph is over, she might break into a bit of a laugh. Um, she made a big impact in the social world of Washington again. She was very good at that. But it wasn't a happy ending. The money ran out. She had to sell Montpelier, most of the remaining slaves, and she ended up in a sort of genteel poverty. Now, ha having held forth it's for some time on Madison's productive partnerships, I want to close with a note about Madison himself. He was able to form these partnerships because of who he was. His genuineness, his modesty, his integrity, and his open-heartedness. I think that's what these different dis types of people found in him. And I found these char characteristics shown through in the way he received the news the end of the War of 1812, when he got the news of the Treaty of Ghent. Now, as I have said, Madison, I think, pushed us into war. He thought it was essential, but it was a terrible time. The entire area, uh, region of New England didn't support the war. Governors of Massachusetts and Connecticut refused to call out the militia to support the war. Uh, there was tremendous dissent throughout the country. He took, never raised a finger against anyone who criticized him or criticized the war. Very different from his predecessors, Adams and Jefferson, who had thrown newspaper editors in jail. Madison tolerated all the dissent. Um, in February 13, 1815, he's living in the Octagon House. Of course, the White House burned six months before. Octagon House still stands in Washington on 17th Street. And a rumor arrives that a treaty has been signed with Britain. A Pennsylvania senator rushes to the Octagon House to ask Madison if it's true. And this is a passage from the book I'd like to just read quickly. The senator found the house dark, the president sitting solitary in his parlor, in perfect tranquility, not even a servant in waiting. The senator asked if the rumor was true. Madison bade him sit down. I will tell you all I know, he said then confirmed that he thought there was peace, but he had no official confirmation. The senator recalled with some wonder what he called the president's self-command on the occasion and greatness of mind. The War of 1812 had truly been Mr. Madison's war, as his opponents called it. It was about principles, not gain. It was fought with a quiet tenacity, sometimes ineptly, and with endless tolerance of those who opposed it. And when peace came, Madison welcomed it in a darkened house, sitting alone with his thoughts. Thanks very much. If you have any questions or thoughts about Madison? Yes, sir. Since Madison was so involved in drafting the Constitution, and uh, one has to presume he, he was involved with the Tenth Amendment, uh, which I take it seemed to 
be the, mean that they thought that if it's not specifically in the Constitution, uh, the federal government can't do it. And therefore, the question is, do you think he was a strict constructionist and would have been surprised at all that's, that's occurred uh, that, that he m might not have thought was sanctioned by the Constitution? You know, Madison is very hard to pigeonhole. Uh, he started out as the great nationalist with Hamilton. He recoiled against Hamilton's creation of a powerful central government and became a states' rights guy. He opposed having a standing army. He thought we should rely on the militia. Then we had the War of 1812, and he discovered the militia was really not much help. And he decided we needed a standing army. And he decided that actually the Bank of the United States that Hamilton had created and Madison had opposed all those years was a good idea. And he was absolutely surprised by things in the Constitution and not in the Constitution that he thought were there and weren't there. It's amazing when he's, they set up, they're setting up the government in 1789 and they're trying to figure out how to get rid of executive officers. We know the president, with the concurrence of the Senate, appoints high officials. Who fires them? The Constitution doesn't say. They forgot it. They just missed it. And Madison writes a letter, I think he says it on the floor of the House, I'm embarrassed that when I went back to read this the other night, I discovered there was nothing there. <laughs> so he writes again in the 18, 18 teens and 1820s in retirement, there are some important decisions by John Marshall creating, enhancing the commerce power and recognizing greater national powers. And Madison is surprised by those and he doesn't like them much. But he also writes this long memo to himself, which is a fascinating one, about how the language changes over time. And it takes on other meanings because the world changes. And therefore, when you write a constitution, it's going to change in meaning. So, yes, I think there are constitutional doctrines Madison would find surprising. He might agree with or might disagree with. But I think he also understood the constitution is not a frozen document, that it changes. Um, it's a little upsetting sometimes to think of it that way. But I, and I think it upset him sometimes to think of it that way. But I think he also appreciated that it had to happen. Then why do you think they put the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution? You know, the Bill of Rights adoption is a baffling exercise because it's so poorly documented. Madison writes them. He wrote about 19, actually, of them. And they kept getting whittled away and combined and, and, and wrenched about. The Senate changed a bunch of them, and the Senate was meeting secretly during this time. For the first seven years we were a country, six years we were a country, the Senate met secretly. So we don't know why they did anything. Um, so I don't think there is a conclusive explanation. I don't think there was any real discussion of the Tenth Amendment. And I think some of that is the reason why the courts have never really implied the Tenth Amendment very strongly, and they're, they're very uncomfortable with it. We don't quite know what it means. Not the best answer, but it's the one I have. The yes, sir. The Bill of Rights was Madison's concession <coughs> to the Anti-Federalists, as mm -hmm. I recall. Um, one thing the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists agreed on was the separation of church and state. And a lot of the founders considered themselves deists. Do we know anything about Madison's belief system? Uh, that's a, a good question. Uh, he is very coy about it through his life. I'm sure that when he met with Jefferson, when they talked socially, that they did talk about such things. Uh, in his public proclamations, he uses these stiff formalisms of a type that tell you almost nothing. My favorite was, we should at the end of the War of 1812, he said, we should give thanks to the great disposer of events. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> Um, he wouldn't use the word God. Um, there are a couple of accounts by people who had conversations with him on religious subjects, and these tended to be sort of religious people. One was a Quaker, 
uh, where they came away saying, I think he agreed with me. And in both accounts, it seems to me that Madison was being courteous and not necessarily agreeing with him. He was avoiding picking an argument. And indeed, in one letter, he writes of religion that it is, of course, a great comfort to think that there is a force behind it all that makes, it all, makes everything make sense. And I hear the unspoken next sentence, but of course I have trouble believing that. But he doesn't write that next sentence. He's always very careful about that. So I, I don't have a good answer. He did occasionally attend traditional services. He would go to Anglican services. Um, I don't know if that was just, uh, again, being a Virginia squire, this is what you did. Uh, we don't have a great record. He was fierce, though, that the right to privacy of conscience, the right to your own conscience, was essential. It was the first right. And in fact, when he wrote what becomes the First Amendment for freedom of religion, it also included a clause that ensured that if you opposed uh, the killing of others, you didn't have to serve in the armed forces. He was going to put that in the Constitution. And for him, respect of people's personal religious beliefs was the absolute uh, uh, the uh, non-negotiable element of the government. So he's very much in tune with Jefferson. Yes. Hamilton. Uh, Hamilton is a churchier figure. Okay. Uh, he he was a pretty traditional Christian and commended his soul to to God on the night before he uh, and to and to his personal savior on the night before he went to face uh, Burr in the duel. So, uh, one last question. If there is one. Uh, expanding on his question, if there isn't another one, I think that the First Amendment came from the Virginia Bill of Rights, which was very much under the Jeffersonian point of view, and which was adopted. It was, the, it was really the fourth, I think, or third or fourth of the 12. <clears throat> so you could argue that that was what out in Virginia and the attitude there, which was adopted, was that there was an absolute wall between church and state. Madison was actually involved in that uh, provision. He was 24 years old at the time. It was his first engagement in public life at the Virginia Constitutional Convention in 1775. And he was the one who changed a key term in that provision in the Virginia Constitution from guaranteeing tolerance of religion to guaranteeing freedom of religion. He thought, we don't just tolerate it. We ensure that it be free. Um, so that was a very important part of his, his heritage. And he and Jefferson fought for that in the Virginia legislature uh, against Patrick Henry in the 1780s. So it, it was his, those were his political roots. Thank you very much for coming. Can we get another round of applause? That was a great, uh, a great presentation. Thank you very much. Very, very educational. Uh, we do have, of course, a uh, lot of copies of Madison's gift behind the counter for uh, Mr. Stewart to sign. We also have his backlist, American Emperor. We have Impeached and the Summer of 1787. For those of you watching online, you still have time to give us a call. We'll get a book signed for you. For those of you here, copies are for sale right there. Mr. Stewart will sign over there at that table. Thank you so much for coming. Enjoy the rest of your evening.